Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gulis Barkan. I'm the uh, current president of the American Society of Cytopathology, and I would like to welcome you all to our Wednesday webinar. Um, so uh, we're excited today. We have uh, a panel, and uh, we have our moderators, uh, Dr. Mike Henry uh, from Mayo Clinic, who, as you know, was one of our past presidents of the American Society of Cytopathology. And uh, I asked him if he could kindly put together a uh, quality assurance and control panel, maybe twisted his arm a little bit, just because this is an issue we all deal with in our own laboratories. And it would be nice to hear from you know, everybody to see what they do in their own laboratories, to see if we could bring home anything to do um, differently, different practice patterns. Uh, so he was kind enough to say, okay, I'll moderate it. And uh, then he ended up twisting others' arms. <laughs> and we have our wonderful panelists. And I can't wait to hear from you guys. What do you do in your own laboratories about quality assurance and control? So welcome, everyone. Here we have it, our panel. All right. Thank you, Glaze. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Um, as uh, Dr. Barkin um, noted, um, she did twist my arm in in order to put this um, uh, together, and it's something, you know, where in cytology we like to show pictures of of cells and that sort of thing. But um, a, a very important part of of running a good cytology laboratory, a quality cytology laboratory, is your your quality program um, that you have to put together. And uh, so uh, I'm going to be talking today uh, a little bit of background about what is required for a quality program in, in cytology. I'll talk a little bit about CLIA, some of the deemed agencies. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, CAP accreditation and uh, briefly touch on some of the areas in CAP accreditation um, that are um, are related to, to CLIA 88 uh, and to a QAQC program and talk a little bit about um, some of the things that we do here in Rochester um, to monitor both our pathologists as well as our, our cytotechnologists. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Brainerd is uh, uh, one of the cytopathologists at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and uh, Dr. Brainerd is, is also, I think, well known to, to many of us, uh, both in the CAP as well as the, the ASC. And she's going to talk about uh, workload requirements, which is also something uh, that falls under the CLIA 88 uh, uh, regulations, and then talk a little bit about some of the things that they do with their quality program at the at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, uh, Lynette uh, Pignot is uh, the uh, one of the operations managers at Regents Hospital in St. Paul, and so she is at a non academic um, cytology uh, laboratory, one of the uh, uh, premier medical centers uh, in, in the Twin Cities, and is a cytotechnologist as, as well. She's going to talk about um, a, a little bit about uh, joint commission accreditation in uh, a laboratory, uh, and talk about how to put a, a QAQC program um, to work in in a in a clinical um, setting, and then uh, we want you all to uh, uh, we want to leave a little bit of time at the end of this, um, hopefully to for questions. Um, and so, if you want to submit your questions, you can you can type them in, and, and Dr. Barkan will uh, will ask them uh, at the end of the program. So as I mentioned, I'm uh, here at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, uh, Minnesota, and I'm going to talk about CLIA 88 and cytology. And cytology, specifically GYN cytology, received some special attention uh, in the CLIA 88, 1988 law that was passed by the, the U.S. Congress. And there were some very specific areas that are actually regulated, federally regulated uh, for cytology. Um, and these include personnel standards, uh, workload limits, uh, which is something that is unusual for anatomic pathology, but that is something that is in the federal regulations. Um, hierarchical review of slides or quality review of slides, uh, rescreen functions, performance evaluations. There are actually very specific things in the law that talk about 
performance evaluations of uh, cytotechnologists and also uh, proficiency testing is a requirement that's in the federal law for uh, GYN cytology, unlike, again, any of the other areas in anatomic pathology. And you might ask why this came about. And for those of us of, of a certain age, we actually remember um, this. There was a Wall Street Journal, Journal article that came out in 1987 um, that talked about pap test misses through lab errors and pap mills and how they were reading slides at home. They were looking at large numbers of slides. And um, this uh, uh, was one of the, the things that actually caused cytology to become a focus of the, the CLIA 88 uh, regulations. So some of the highlights uh, for uh, CLIA 88, um, this is a very long document. It's something that has been updated um, uh, as time has gone on, but uh, these are the, the basics of CLIA 88. There are workload limits for cytotechnologists. This has changed a little bit, and, and Dr. Brainerd will, will talk about this. Uh, quality control procedures that are actually regulated as part of these federal regulations requiring five-year retrospective rescreening of PAPS and cytohistologic correlation in cytology. It also requires pathologist review for abnormal PAPS and, re and PAPS that are set up by the cytotechnologist as reactive or reparative changes. And this is actually written in the regulations. It also required uh, proficiency testing and unannounced validation surveys of CLIA certified laboratories. And you might ask, why is this important? Well, it's important for any laboratory to receive Medicare or Medicaid payments that you have to have a CLIA certificate. And if you do not have that CLIA certificate, then you cannot, um, you cannot do those sorts of specimens and you cannot collect payments for them. And in order to maintain your CLIA certificate, you must be accredited. Um, and there are a number of accrediting agencies, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. There are also state licenses, which you can get in lieu of CLIA certificates in some states. And uh, interestingly enough, in, in New York, for, for certain, um, those requirements for the New York state are actually more stringent than the CLIA, the national uh, federal CLIA requirements. So all laboratories with a CLIA certificate must be inspected, um, and these are unannounced inspections uh, by a deemed accrediting agency. And the accrediting agency um, has to be, uh, and when I say deemed, it has to be deemed by CLIA. Uh, so these deemed agencies will develop an accreditation uh, process. They must, at a minimum, follow the CLIA regulations. Uh, most of the accrediting agencies have other things that they have added to their uh, accreditation process. But at a minimum, they have to have all of those uh, CLIA regulations covered in their accreditation process. And also, these processes are re are. Um, uh, reviewed by CMS peri periodically, and they have to pass CMS muster uh, in order uh, to be continued to be deemed uh, by that. So uh, the CAP is, is one of the accrediting agencies through their laboratory accreditation process. And uh, they are probably the largest or they are the largest uh, accrediting agency in, in the United States. Um, over 60% of laboratories uh, get um, have a CAP accreditation. But the CAP can't just hair off on their own in their accreditation process. As I mentioned, they're a deemed, it's a deemed status. So they actually fall under CLIA 88 and they fall under CMS, uh, which reviews this process. The Joint Commission is the second largest uh, accrediting agency. Um, in most hospitals or in many hospitals that are inspected by the Joint Commission, um, there is a reciprocity with CAP for the laboratory. However, the Joint Commission also uh, can inspect laboratories on their own. And then there are a few other uh, agencies that also uh, have deemed status uh, with CMS for accrediting uh, laboratories. But most laboratories in the U.S. at least are accredited by either the CAP or the Joint Commission. 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of this quality assurance, quality control process that fall under CLIA 88, and I'll talk specifically about some areas in the CAP uh, accreditation program uh, that addresses these. So CLIA 88 requires statistical records, and in uh, the uh, CYP 7400, uh, they require a record of at least the number of specimens, non-GYN and GYN, uh, type and source of these uh, samples, and it has to include the diagnostic categories, and it has to include uh, cases, uh, the numbers of cases that were signed out as unsatisfactory for evaluation. Um, I also think as part of a good quality program, um, you should include, and it should also, this should also include as part of CLIA 88 um, and a good QA program, the number of PAPs with discrepant histology, the number of negative PAPs that have been reclassified as abnormal through the quality program, and the number of, of PAPs that are reported as HCIL adenocarcinoma or other malignant neoplasms that don't have histologic follow-up because um, uh, uh, some laboratories that are reference laboratories don't get the follow-up histology, but you need to keep track of that. CYP 7478 addresses the 10% rescreening, which is specifically addressed in, in the CLIA 88 uh, regulations. Um, it has to in, uh, be a random 10% of your GYN cytology cases with an inclusion of uh, your high risk cases. So you need to have a process to try to identify your high risk cases and those are included in your 10% rescreen. Um, we have talked about this in cytology uh, quite a bit and the 10% rescreening is not the best quality measure. And I certainly think that if it was the only quality measure that you used in your laboratory, um, you would not have a good quality program, but it is required um, by uh, these accrediting agencies. It is a prospective review, which means that you have to do that 10% uh, screening prior to the release of the report. And it has to be done by a technologist or general supervisor um, with at least three years full-time experience in the past 10 years in gynecologic screening. Um, you have to record the rescreening diagnosis versus the original, and those data should be monitored and they should com be compared with your laboratory averages, and they should be part of your evaluation for your cytotechnologist when you are evaluating them, and they have to be evaluated at least semi-annually. So CAP um, 7517 and, and CYP 7530 address retrospective rescreening, and this is also required by the regulations. All negative previous um, screens for the past five years have to be reviewed uh, following a new uh, uh, cytology diagnosis of HCIL or cancer. Um, if you, um, so if you have a PAP that has at least HCIL or cancer. You have to go back through your negatives. You have to look at those negatives and rescreen them to see if something was missed. That is the minimum that is required by the CAP and CLIA. Um, also, if a discrepancy is found that affects current patient care, the physician must be notified and an amended report issued. Now, for this particular process, that would be an extremely unusual event because the current diagnosis of HCIL or cancer is most likely what is going to be driving patient care. And so in most cases, um, you do not need to go back and amend those reports, but you have to make this part of your quality program. Uh, and this is a very good way of finding out if you have issues in your, your screening program. Um, as I mentioned, this is minimum and most laboratories and certainly here at the Mayo Clinic, we add in um, LCIL cases, we add in ASCH, and we add in histology. So if we have a histologic diagnosis of HCIL um, on a cervical biopsy, we will go back and look at prior negative PAPs for that particular in individual, and we include endometrial adenocarcinoma as part of this. So we have expanded it beyond what is the minimum requirement, and I think that is a, a good idea if, if possible in your program.
So again, in, in our laboratory, we have four forms of slide uh, re-examination. We have two prospective ones, our 10% rescreen, and we also rescreen our HPV positives in our co-testing population. So if we do a co-test and it's HPV positive and the cytology is negative, we will rescreen that. And we have found, again, that to be an effective way of finding uh, potential issues in our laboratory. Retrospective means that it is done after the case is signed out. Um, we review all of our negative PAPs from patients with current age still or above. And I, as I mentioned, we include some other things uh, as part of that. And we also um, review discrepancies between uh, uh, cervical cytology and biopsy results, as I mentioned. CYP7600 statistical records, you have to record uh, diagnostic categories, including unsatisfactory. And uh, in this uh, CYP7600, there are benchmark tables that you can use to compare your laboratory results. Um, and it specifically states in there that if a lab ASC to SIL ratio falls outside of the 5th or 95th percentile, you have to explore that and you have to explain it. So if an inspector comes in and he sees that, he's going to ask or he or she is going to ask, um, how did you or what did you do about this? Um, Significant cytohisto discrepancies um, have to be explored, and those are defined by the individual laboratory, but it has to be defined in your quality program. Um, cases where rescreen result in reclassification have to be um, uh, addressed and recorded. Um, cases for which histology is available for H cell or malignant cytology. Again, you need to keep records of that. And if you look at the, the CAP benchmarks um, uh, and down at the bottom of this, this is something that we use in, in our laboratory. These are our pathologist results, and we uh, and look at this quarterly. And we look at our ASCUS to SIL ratios, which you can see on the right side. And then we compare, we have a goal for that in our laboratory, which is, which is less than, than two. Um, but we compare that to the CAP, and you can see that the 50th percentile for the CAP is right around 1.6. And in our lab, our uh, ASC to SIL ratio is uh, averages out at, at 1.4. And if again, if, if you are outside the 5th or 95th percentile, you have to explain that. Um, also, uh, CYP7653 talks about high-risk HPV records, and if available records are if available records are maintained for high-risk HPV performed on your ASCUS cases, you have to record that and, and look at that, and that's what CYP7653 talks about. This is a minimum requirement. And I find that high-risk HPV uh, testing uh, is a very useful quality metric, and it should be monitored, if at all possible, in your cytology laboratory as part of your laboratory process. And again, uh, the College of American Pathologists has uh, published um, some really good data that you can use to compare your laboratory results um, to um, other laboratories across the country. Um, laboratories across the country uh, at the 50th percentile, 38% of their ASCUS cases are HPV positive. I feel that if you're if you fall below, you know, uh, say 20% or above um, about uh, probably 55%, you probably should be looking at why that is in your laboratory. They've also published data for ASCH and for NIL um, cases, um, and you can see what the 50th percentile is for those. Um, they also have published in that same article, um, again, uh, data show for women that are over 30 and for women that are under 30. So the under 30 ones are the ones that are typically uh, collected in your reflex HPV uh, cytologies. The over 30 is most often collected in your co-test uh, population. And you can see that this varies. So if you have a very, very young population in your laboratory, um, you're going to have a higher HPV percentile than you would if your 
lab is predominantly looking at women who are over the age of, of 30. So this is something that, again, when you're comparing your results to published results, um, you, can, you can look at. Um, also published out there, and this is um, some data that, that we have uh, actually published, um, you can find out what if you have a, a test that does genotyping uh, for high-risk HPV, you can actually look at um, your HPV 16, your HPV 18, and your HPV others, and compare that again to published data that, that is out there. And this is data that, that we published in our, our population here in, in the Midwest. So again, some examples uh, for the QAQC process using HPV testing. These are examples, again, from, from our laboratory. Um, we follow um, our ask us to HPV reflex summary. Um, you can see that it varies somewhat um, over, uh, over time, but we want to make sure that it falls within a, a certain range. And if it falls outside of those um, lower or upper limits, um, then we start a QA process to find out why um, that is happening. We also um, look at our HPV results by diagnosis. And uh, you'll notice that, that while um, high-risk HPV is positive in the vast majority of your H cells, it's not 100%. It's actually uh, around 90 to 94% in, in most published data. But this is, again, something that you can use for your both your cytotechnologist as well as your cytopathologist to see if they are falling within um, ranges within your work, within your laboratory. And we use this data when we're evaluating our cytotechnologists. And again, quarterly, we look at our reflex HPV results with our ASCUS cases and along with our ASCUS to SIL ratios, and we look for um, individuals that might fall out of uh, the laboratory's um, uh, percents. And then we will uh, we give this information to the individual pathologist. And if somebody is significantly outside of these ranges, we will look for the reasons for that. Um, we also uh, uh, look at pathologist reviewed cases again, as I was mentioning, for all of our diagnoses. And we give this again to our individual pathologists. And at this point, I am now going to pass this off to Dr. Jennifer uh, Brainerd, who's going to talk about the Cleveland Clinic experience, as well as some issue, uh, some things on workload limits. Jennifer. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, I included my photo here because I gave my camera to the Cytotechnology School, um, and they're using it today for a Cytotech interview. So I am a potential student interview. So I'm sorry, I included my photo here. Uh, I look much better in the photo anyways than I do today. So um, um, I included on that title slide my email address. So if there's anything I present um, form-wise, I'm going to show you some examples of our forms, things that we use each day. Um, I you can feel free to email me and I, I've checked with the laboratory manager and she would be more than happy if we share those with you. So if there's anything you want uh, from what I show, um, please send me a note and I'll forward it right to you. Okay, uh, next slide, please, Mike. Okay, so Mike asked me to talk about uh, workload limits and um, everybody's favorite topic um, uh, about that. Um, uh, as Mike mentioned, CLIA 88 uh, sets workload limits. And the workload limits are a little bit different for manually screened slides versus computer-assisted screening, which I'll get into. But the, So this applies to manual screening. So CLIA 88 allows a maximum primary <laughs> manual screening of 100 slides per day over no less than an eight hour time period, which equates to, to a pro, which equates to exactly 12.5 12 12 slides per hour. It applies to both previously unscreened GYN and non-GYN slides. And slides uh, uh, for cytotechnologist slides manually rescreened for QC are included in this count. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. 
all manually screened GYN slides. So anything screened manually counts as an has an entire slide, a one, regardless of the type of preparation. Non-GYN liquid-based slide preparations can be counted as half slides if the sample covers one half or less of the total slide area. So for example, a typical cytospin or a typical uh, thin prep if you use that to process some uh, non-gen fluids um, uh, that can count as half a slide. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. Records must be maintained showing the total number of slides examined by each individual during each day or during a one-day period, so each 24 hours. For employees that screen less than eight hours at an individual laboratory, the workload maximum must be prorated, meaning if you screen for six hours, your total slide number can only be 75, which is, I like to use just the 12 and a half slides per hour times six. Uh, to me, that's easier, but there are other ways to calculate that as well. But uh, you have to, the bottom line is you need to prorate uh, um, the workload limit if you are screening less than eight hours. Uh, next slide, please. This is kind of one of the reasons I think Mike asked me to talk about this because uh, we are both on the, the CAP uh, Cytopath Committee, or I, I just rotated off, but we were on it together. And uh, one of the things uh, we address is some of the hot button uh, issues related to deficiencies in CAP inspections. And this is a real life scenario that has replayed itself multiple times over the past few years uh, with me. I'm pathologist B. So I, it is very common for me to receive a call from a person who is in acute distress because the CAP inspectors are on are in their facility that day and they're asking for his or her records, the pathologist records of FNA slide screening. And they, they believe it can't be right. Um, they screen their own slides. They've been doing so for years and they don't keep track. Um, and I go through this discussion and, and, and people get pretty upset. You know, I've never heard that before. This has to be wrong. Aren't my boards good for anything? Why can I not do this? And I have to, I have to say that I'm sorry, but it is correct and that it is a phase two deficiency and that no, you cannot go back while the inspector is there and count up your slides for the whole past year. Uh, that will not work. So, so this is a real life scenario. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the section of the CAP checklist that deals with workload limits. And this is specific for pathologists. It's CYP08500. And it's on, I did not underline this. The checklist makers underline this. And it is the only thing underlined in the cytopath section of the checklist, as far as I could tell. So that's the way us, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the writers of the checklist try to make something important. <laughs> So this is underlined. So pathologists who screen previously unscreened GYN slides and previously unscreened non-GYN slides, which includes FNAs, must adhere to and record the workload limits. So, and you have to keep records for, for each person. Uh, next slide, please. There are a few things that you don't have to count as a pathologist. So things that are screened by a cytotechnologist before you, you get it, such as uh, GYN slides that are uh, previously screened. Rescreen five-year uh, review slides. The 10% rescreen of negative GYN slides and previously screened non-GINs and FNA slides. And this is actually a list that's straight out of the CAP uh, checklist. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing that's important that came out in 2018, I believe, is this CMS memo that provided clarification on how you calculate or what you do regarding adequacy assessment slides. 
um, because this was a this was uh, an issue that that came up in a number of inspections in the in the 2017 2016 time frame where people were getting cited for this. Uh, so this is a clarification. CMS provided. Um, uh, that all screening person for all screening personnel, which is cytotechs and cytopathologists, uh, adequacy assessment of FNA smears or anything included in rows is not considered primary cytology screening, which means you do not have to count those slides towards your workload limits. However, you do have to subtract the time you spend performing adequacy assessments from the total number of hours you spend screening. So if you spend two hours of your eight-hour day doing adequacy assessments, then your screening needs to be prorated for that six-hour screening period. So you have to account for your time, in other words. Okay, next slide, please. Automated screening, and this can get a little bit complicated, um, but this is... Um, um, what the the CMS requires um, that cases that, and I'm uh, using the thin prep imaging system as an example here. Um, all slides with full manual review count as one slide equivalent. So any slide you're really doing the whole manual review on that counts as one. All slides with field of view only. So if you only look at the 22 fields of view selected by the instrument and you sign that uh, PAP test out as negative, that can count as a half a slide. And if you do both, so if you review the fields of view and then you do a full manual review, that counts as one and a half uh, slides. And so you have to, um, you can, you need to count those up and it should not exceed the maximum limit of 100 of 100 uh, in an eight-hour day. Okay, next slide, please. And this can be hard, and this might be hard to see, and we don't have to go over this, but this is an automatic calculation of workload that we use where the Cytotech inputs values in the gray uh, area. So you put the number of hours you work, the hours you, or the pathologist for that matter, the number of hours you screen, this, and then the total number of slides with 10, 22 fields of view only versus the 22 fields of view plus the full screen. And then the, the program calculates for you your total number of slides for the day and a total number of slides that you, this individual has screened per hour. Um, next slide, please. And that's inputted into this Excel spreadsheet. The, uh, this is also a way of us keeping track of non-screening activities. So things that don't count as screening, such as if this person was on adequacy, they would uh, include that on this, on this form. Or they had to file their slides, so they subtracted that amount of, of time. If they were at another facility, our cytotechnologists rotate among multiple hospitals, and they, they this is where they would account for where they were and uh, uh, what they did that was not uh, screening related. Uh, next slide, please. It's, it was, it's, a, it's a nice way to keep track of what everybody is doing, and, and it, it makes... Uh, the individuals keeping track of their daily screening totals um, much easier. Okay, so as, as Dr. Henry mentioned, workload limits uh, are set by the technical supervisor of each laboratory based on an individual's ability. Importantly, this is not a productivity goal. It's an absolute maximum slide number that's set for this individual each day. And it's reassessed, as, as Mike mentioned, every six months. And it needs to include data on rescreening, the retrospective and prospective rescreening, and CT and pathologist correlation data, um, cytohisto correlation, other factors can be uh, considered as well. 
This also applies in, in the con to, to pathologists who are primary screeners also. So this information has to be um, uh, included if pathologists are primarily screening slides. Uh, next slide, please. And I included some examples of our forms for... Um, which I think are very are nice. I, you know, I haven't seen a ton of forms like this uh, from other hospitals so or other practices. So your form might be better, but I just thought I would give you some um, uh, give you an example. This is how we calculate workload. We we uh, count the number of disagreements. Uh, among the pathologists and cytotechnologists, as well as the uh, five-year reviews. We, like uh, Mayo Clinic, do uh, review high high sill surgical pathology specimens and go back to the PAP. And so we track that. We uh, count, we include information on total QC discrepancies, as well as MD uh, review rates. We like to keep track of that as well. We summarize uh, discrepancy cases, which we categorize as a two-step difference uh, between the cytotech's interpretation and the pathologist's um, interpretation. Um, and we do not use this. We, we, we do make sure people participate in educational programs, um, and we include uh, educational program scores on this sheet. Um, and we track these diagnoses as well as ask us to sill ratio um, uh, for each cytotechnologist. Uh, next slide, please. And we do the same for GYN. We look at um, participation in CAP educational programs. We were finding in the past that sometimes the individuals who were having the most issues with non-gen discrepancies were the ones who were skipping our uh, educational sessions for um, the, our educational subscription programs. So we don't use this to punish a person. We just want to make sure they're attending. And one way we can ensure that is if they keep track of how they did. Um, and they have to explain if they did not review an educational material uh, provided by the laboratory. We have, we have, we ask them to explain why they did not. Um, next slide, please. And this is a case review form, which I really liked. I, I directed the laboratory for about 15 years, and I really liked looking at this um, each six-month period, which is a list of cases that uh, Cytotech reviewed and, and why they reviewed it. Um, did they review it because it was a discrepant five-year review? Did they review it because it was a challenging case that they wanted to look at? And they include who they reviewed it with because I really wanted uh, cytotechnologists and pathologists to look at slides together, particularly on the two-step discrepancies. So I really wanted the cytotechnologist to get the input from the pathologist about why he or she called something the way they did and what could they learn from that. So this is a, this is a good thing uh, to look at. We you can tell from this. I think pretty readily where a person might need a little more help. So if somebody's discrepancies are all on thyroids, then you know exactly that perhaps this person, we could provide some more education in that realm. Uh, next slide, please. And if we fall short in some area, such as I was doing workload, if we found somebody who went over in their workload for a day, for example. We track these as quality improvement notes. This is actually a fillable PDF form, which shows basically what we did, what happened, uh, what we're doing to not have that particular situation happen again. Was there impact on the patient? What did we do to fix it? And uh, do we have to do anything, uh, any additional monitoring? And everyone has to sign to make sure that everybody knows that that we did. So it, it, when an inspector comes and they can they say, oh, on this day, you did this, or your temperature was out of whack, or something was like that, you, you can pull up this note, which is filled out 
each time that we recognize ourselves that we've done something outside of the scope of our quality plan. And we keep track of these. So um, we can we can say, okay, we've had a couple of these notes written in this exact same area in this two-month period. We have to do something about this. So it's a way to bring your errors to the, to the forefront and deal with them. Um, okay, next slide, please. And then some things that have helped us as far as our quality plan is uh, integration under one leadership team. At the beginning, we, have, we are a nine hospital system in Northeast Ohio. Uh, we do cytology at four on site. And at the beginning, we had individual labs with individual super, supervision and individual leaders and that proved challenging and and we found that when we're all integrated under one leadership team we're all using the same quality manual we all did we're doing a lot better we actually also were able to hire a cytotechnologist dedicated to quality whose job it is to make sure that all of our sites are in compliance with our quality plan. So uh, that has been very, very, very helpful for us. We huddle each day to talk about what are the issues of the day. It allows real-time discussion of what we, what we have and we take notes on those huddles and we summarize so we know if the same things are popping up, that's what we need to, to address. And I think one thing that we're very good at is addressing negative trends through education. So when we see something that keeps happening, we have shown and we can prove uh, that we do a better job after we re-educate uh, uh, our group. And so we, we, have, we have some good examples of that. All right, uh, next slide, please. This is my last. And I, I just wanted to show these forms. This is exactly like I didn't realize uh, Dr. Henry and our form is quite similar. This is the incorporation of HPV results into and our uh, diagnostic categories. Um, we do that for all of our pathologists. And my last slide uh, next, Mike, is uh, we compare each other to all of our we have, in this instance, there's 20 cytopathologists, I think, and you find your number and figure out where you are on this list and compare yourself. So I just wanted to show that. Okay, um, and that's all for my presentation. Thank you, Mike. I'll turn it over to Lynette. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Brainerd. Um, I also do not have a camera today. I had intended to, but um, I'm on a different PC than I thought I was going to be on, and I could not figure out how to give my camera access. So... Um, you don't get a picture of me, but you do get a picture of the hospital where I'm at today. So <laughs> that's what this is. Um, just to give you a little bit of background. So thanks to Dr. Henry for that introduction. Um, I am operations manager. Most of you probably, or some of you know um, that cytology is my background. Um, and I still do oversee cytology uh, as one of my sections within the laboratories. Uh, so as we begin here today, I'd like to just give you a little bit of a background uh, from from my perspective, um, go ahead and next slide, please, Dr. Henry. Um, we can go to the next one too. So a little bit about uh, where we're at. Um, I work at a level one trauma center. We have 509 beds and we are part of the health partners uh, family of care. Um, and so if you move on to the next slide, Mike. As uh, Jennifer mentioned, you know, uh, we are also part of a larger system. We have 90 hospitals and clinics. We actually have eight hospitals. Uh, we do cytology at two of them. We have one system microbiology lab that falls under um, my direction as well, and two AP system laboratories uh, that uh, I share with a dyad. Um, and we do have some of the same, um, or saw some of the same uh, challenges that Jennifer mentioned as far as trying to work as a system and then having maybe some silo QA policy. So we are actually uh, systemizing as well and uh, working through that optimization process. If you go to the next slide. Uh, as far as our local cytology laboratory, we have 10 team members, uh, which include eight and a half full-time FDs for cytotechs. We have two processing staff and we have one specialist who oversees the area. We have about 35 thousand PAP tests a year, about 1,500 FNAs, and we do about 3,000 non-GINs. Um, and we have one medical director 
that has oversight for cytopathology across the system. As I mentioned, we do um, AP at two labs, and that, of course, includes cytology. And I think that that has really helped us in standardizing our approach and our quality plan um, across the laboratories. Next slide, please. So what Dr. Henry asked me to talk about today was a little bit of the Joint Commission perspective of quality and um, QC and QA and how that ties to accreditation, um, but really also then to talk about how do we develop our overarching plan. We've talked a lot today about some of the specific um, elements within accreditation from CAPS perspective and also um, through um, quality improvement um, that Dr. Brainerd showed you. Um, and I'd like to bring the level up a little bit and just uh, show you some tools that we use um, that tie in through the Joint Commission. Uh, I am at a Joint Commission accredited laboratory and I know that most of our AP laboratories are not, so it's a little bit of a different spin. And then to talk a little bit about how we've developed um, our overall plan uh, for quality and how we do that. So next slide, please. So this is just a screenshot of a electronic manual that we have for accreditation for the Joint Commission. And as you can see, this is very small. I don't expect you to be able to read it, but it really just highlights the similarities between the Joint Commission and the CAP as far as the accreditation uh, elements of performance and standards. As um, Dr. Henry mentioned, the Joint Commission does have dean status with CLIA and with the CMS, and this is just a highlight. If we were to focus on that QSA 080301, the cytology technical supervisor using quality improvement to process, measure, assess, and improve the cytology service. I'm going to use that a little bit as a guidepost as we talk through some of my slides. Next slide, please. So if you look at this next slide, what we've done is I've blown open that particular standard and you can see those elements of performance, very small, but it was just meant to give you a taste. And within these standards, you can see that it includes a written plan for quality. It includes data, as Dr. Henry said earlier. It includes the things that we're used to hearing through CAP as far as the high grade lookbacks, the 10% rescreens, um, the other elements, the cytohistocorrelation, things that we're used to doing and hearing in cytology. It also asks us to continue to measure, assess, and improve our quality plans. You can see on the side here, they also have crosswalked against TACLIA. So this shows you a nice comparison of what Dr. Henry mentioned earlier of how the Joint Commission has deemed status with the CMS and how they've aligned their standards to CLIA. Um, so going on to the next slide. So the Joint Commission uses two tools uh, very strongly in how they um, identify risk or deficiencies within a laboratory or best practices as the case may be as they're coming through and doing accreditation. And we use this really to help us develop our quality plan. I would like also to mention that um, the Joint Commission has not um, traditionally been or have been perceived to been very strong in accreditation for anatomic pathology um, and laboratory. Um, I will say that they have been working hard to improve that. They have a couple different advisory committees um, to help support them in that um, improvement. One is the Pathology Technical Advisory um, and Panel, and the other is Laboratory Accreditation Advisory Council. And I sit actually on both of those, so just to give you that um, perspective as we go through this. So the first item I'd like to talk about is the tracer. So if we move on to the next slide. The tracer methodology, and some of you may have heard of this, if you're in a hospital setting and your hospital is Joint Commission accredited, you may have participated in a tracer event where um, they came through the lab during a hospital survey. So it really follows the experience of care through real patient scenarios or examples. And there are three, three different types of tracers. The individual, which is the one that you might be most familiar with, with that follows a selected individual served throughout the individual's care. So if we talk about a pap test, for example, they may pull a patient that has had a pap and then followed the process, have how are your maintenance records? Did you do your stain check? Um, how was the slide signed out? Did that cytotechnologist have their um, workload documented appropriately? Was there, a cyto, was there a biopsy afterwards? Was there cytohistocorrelation? Did we have proper follow-up? So that's an idea of how they would take through that individual tracer. Accreditation specific items, 
are those things that are preset tracers that we probably kind of may, might know that they're going to come in and look for. Um, and they're really based on um, literature review or things that are current um, and happening within the world of laboratory. A great example of this is COVID. So knowing that COVID has really impacted all of our services and the things that we provide and safety to patients as well as to staff, um, we would expect that um, the Joint Commission would come in and maybe do a tracer specifically focusing on those COVID type of issues and how we manage that in the laboratory. And the third piece is a system review, which really is talking about the evaluation of processes. They talk to the staff. They want to see how the flow of work um, is going through the laboratory, how communication is going back and forth between staff and maybe the people in the in the in the hospital, for example, or with other pathologists, how communication is handled. Um, if we have a patient safety culture, if those things are uh, readily um, recited by the staff, if they ask a question about um, fire safety or life safety or the or the um, the like, so. The point of the tracer methodology is to really to follow the work. It's not so much to kind of check off the list of a checklist and make sure that we've met all of those criteria, but really to see our quality plan in action and to validate the process. So next slide, please. The other tool that the Joint Commission started using um, relatively recently, I would say within the last couple of years, is the SAFER matrix. SAFER stands for Survey Analysis of Evaluating Risk. It's meant to identify and communicate those risk levels that they found through our survey process and give you a real nice visual summary of their findings. And it helps organizations and laboratories understand where they can best prioritize and focus areas for improvement. So if you go to the next slide, you will see that I've given you an example of a safer matrix. And I happen to just drop one of our uh, elements of performance in the matrix so you can get an idea of how this might look. Now through a survey, you would maybe expect to have a handful of elements of performance that would be identified and they would be scattered on the safer matrix based on their um, scope of um, risk. So how much likelihood there would be to risk to patient, staff, visitor that would be lined up on the right hand side and the, or excuse me, the left hand side. And then across the bottom, if it was a limited time, we only saw it once on a survey. If it was a pattern, we saw a handful of these. And then if it was widespread, like we really have a gap here that we need to close. This particular element of performance that I've listed is actually workload records and it's the documentation of workload rec records for cytology. So let's say we had a cytotechnologist who forgot to do their workload records on any given day and an inspector came in and they noticed three times or four times out of a month that this particular cytotechnologist forgot to, forgot to record their workload records. So it might be a pattern at that point. We've seen it a couple times. The impact might be low because maybe we've looked and we've seen that the medical director has looked at their maximum workload limits every six months. He, we have seen that there haven't been a lot of deficiencies or two-step discrepancies. All of the other QC and QA that we do as part of accreditation is good for the cytotech, but they just haven't documented. So in that case, um, it would probably be a low likelihood to harm, and, but it is noticed as a pattern. So we see this kind of light orange box that we've dropped it into. Next slide, please. So you can see from here that depending on where a deficiency would land in the safer matrix, the more severe or the more, I don't say severe, but I guess the highest level of risk there could be to patient or to harm. So in our example, we have this light orange. It would be a moderate um, and a pattern. So it would be a 60-day evidence of standards compliance. Basically, we would have 60 days to correct that action and, and prove that we've done what we needed. If this was a higher level deficiency where there was a higher, higher level of concern of risk, we would also not only need to prove that we've uh, improved that process so that we've clear, we've we've identified the risk and we've corrected it, but we also would need to determine that we've had a system in place for leadership involvement and preventative analysis. These are part of the things that are also in our accreditation manual that basically says we have put a system in place to ensure that we can consistently meet the standard and that it is sustainable over time, okay? So next slide. So how do we use this information to develop our quality plan? Well, we may take a safer matrix and depending on how, what lands in the safer matrix, we would take anything that would be at a higher risk or a higher gap and say, okay, we're gonna focus on these things for a given year. So if you go to the next slide, 
you can see an example of what we would write up as our quality plan. Now, this is an, a, this is an example. It's not an exact copy of our quality plan, but it gives you an idea of what our purpose is. We want to have an overarching plan that can, will measure, assess, and improve our performance. And we don't talk about, we don't use this language a lot in cytology and anatomic pathology, but the main lab or the main lab, the core lab it really does. It We talk about pre and post analytic performance, you know, how samples coming into the lab are received. Do we have a lot of defects in those? When we sign out reports or the aftercare for patients, cytohistocorrelation, that's all post analytic. And of course, analytic would be like when we're actually rendering diagnoses or interpretations. So how do we have a system for auditing, confirming results, detecting those errors? We have a definition of a defect. That's what we call these things. Um, you might have heard the term defect used by Henry Ford as well. They use this a lot in their lean programs. It's any flaw, imperfection, deficiency in the performance that, that would require us to stop or delay our work in order to correct the problem. And I would also include in the statement that we could be a risk to patient safety or employee safety as well. And then our process. So this is something about the culture. How do we put this into the culture of the staff so they understand it's not necessarily punitive, but it's something that we want to be open and transparent about and that we also want to use to improve our, our care and our services. So defects can re be reported by any staff member to any member of leadership. We use a multitude of different ways to track these um, defects. Um, we can we use a lot for pre-analytic. We use flags in our beaker um, laboratory information system a lot. We can put a flag on things as they come in if they're not um, ordered appropriately or if the containers are incorrect, things of the like. And then we're able to pull that data and be able to share it back with the submitting locations to be able to improve those situations. Um, we're reviewed. If it's an internal and analytic error, then we review with the staff at the time of reporting and we follow up if appropriate, depending on how it would like land in our safer matrix, so to speak. And then at least annually, um, a lot of these things we're monitoring daily, weekly, monthly, um, but we don't technically, we don't pigeonhole ourselves to that unless it's a requirement through the, um, through our um, accreditation process. Um, we review, we trend data, we look for areas of improvement that maybe we're seeing a pattern, as Dr. Brainerd mentioned, that they have the forms that they use and they, if they see a pattern in some of those defects and they're going back and addressing them, we do similar um, things. And then... Um, we do roll up cumulative results and share them with employees, but also roll them out and share them with leadership. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see where this is kind of in a, a slide example of what we would look at. We do break out our uh, quality plan, and this is a small snapshot. As you know, just for cytology alone, there can be upwards of 50 elements of performance that you might need to include, plus the, the ones that might not even be in accreditation that you yourself want to focus on. So this is just a quick snapshot. I actually have a big spreadsheet that includes all of anatomic pathology in this, and we include pre-analytic pre monitors, so lost specimens, uh, specimen identification, accessioning quality might be things that we would include in pre-analytic. Analytic would be, again, like processing quality, defects that occur, um, like um, maybe we're using the wrong processor runs or we used the incorrect stain, things like that. Um, staining, cover sipping, case assembly and distribution, that's, that's how our cases are distributed to the pathologists. And then rows to final would be something that we would be looking at as well for uh, analytic monitors. And then post-analytic, those are all the things that you're kind of used to seeing, the results notification, high-grade review, discrepancies, and the like, okay? On this sheet, you can see that we've given a clear description. We've learned over time because we have a quality manager as well that what I think I'm reporting to them and that what they think that I'm reporting might be get lost in translation sometimes, especially for folks that might not necessarily be cytology-driven. So we give very... Um, clear descriptions on what this monitor is and what it's intended to do. We give a clear measurement of what is our denominator, what's our numerator, what are we measuring? So we all know. And of course, if something happens and I don't show up for work <laughs> for a month or something, somebody else knows how to calculate the data. What our threshold is, again, these are just examples. They're not our true thresholds. And you might have to baseline. You might decide to... Um, measure something this year because it's come up, you know, you've seen a pattern and maybe you don't know what the threshold should be. So maybe, you know, we've done this uh, quite frequently where we just say, okay, well, let's just get gather data for a year and see what our number is, what our percentage is. And then maybe we try and improve that by 20%, 25%, 50%, whatever that number is. Um, 
and continue to improve over time. I would tell you that's kind of how we got some of that accessioning quality thresholds is based on improvement over time with the staff and the learning and the training. We've, you know, we've gotten most of those errors well below a half a percent probably at this point. And then the frequency at which we measure them. So it's always very clear to everyone about how frequently we're monitoring, what our thresholds, what our measurements are in the description of those quality metrics. If you go to the next slide, you can see here that um, we have um, a roll up of this example. So again, really small, but it's just meant to show you this would be a dashboard that maybe we would report up uh, that would say um, if we did if we were reporting monthly, we would put it in the monthly boxes. If it was quarterly, it would just go in those quarterly boxes. If it's an annual review, then it would go into that year end. But it's a really nice split, uh, snapshot of how we're doing, how we're trending. And I would typically create maybe some graphs um, out of this. This is an Excel spreadsheet, and I would probably create some tables and graphs to be able to see changes over time and improvement. So that's a quick flyby of kind of how we would develop our overarching plan to address some of these other smaller indicators and uh, how we try to put that into practice every day. So I will wrap that up and uh, we can move to the next slide and we can ask for questions. All right. Um, it's... Uh 12 o'clock, or it's actually, it's, well, it's one o'clock central time. It's probably um, 2 p.m. the other time. Um, Sandra, are we able to, to still take some questions? We can take some questions. We can take some questions. And there are some questions uh, from our participants. If you all have time, um, I can ask some of those uh, to you guys. Um, so one question is um, to all of you. What would be the most common deficiencies reported in the cytology laboratory on a uh, College of American Pathologists or Joint Commission inspection? What should the lab directors or the laboratory supervisors um, maybe focus on? That's an, um, that's an interesting question. I think, um, as Jennifer mentioned, actually one of the, the most common ones is actually workload recording. Mm -hmm. um, and workload yeah. recording um, often is an area where uh, there is there is a significant um, or problem. And uh, other than that, um, the CAP looks at um, trends and um, uh, uh, t and I believe um, I'm not sure if they publish that, but um, it it really kind of varies. When I was on the accreditation committee, what we noted is that the the uh, uh, Deficiencies really kind of ran the gamut, but but certainly workload recording was one of the most common. Mm -hmm. And kind of along those lines, uh, I guess the question goes to Dr. Brainerd. Does you know it could go to any one of you too? But um, so according to the description, um, the pathologist should be recording the workload limits if they're actually signing out their FNAs without being pre-screened. What happens in programs if there are fellows or residents, uh, but the site of technologists haven't reviewed it. Do they yeah. have to, does someone have to uh, you know, record this? How does it go? You know, that's a little bit of a sticky wicket. Uh, so some places have tried to float that to their inspectors as a pre-screening. It does not work. Oh. So you cannot count that as previously screened slides. Residents and fellows, well, they may be excellent and many are. They are not trained <laughs> screening. They're not trained screeners. So it, it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't count. So um, I, I know people have tr have tried that and have, have had some serious consequences as a result with rescreening being demanded at their institution for a number of years and things like that. So I would say that would not be a good way to try to satisfy this requirement. That, that's, that's what I have seen in the state of Ohio. And that's correct, Jennifer. That's, that's absolutely correct. So what I'm hearing is that if that is the case, then the pathologist still needs to report the number of slides they've reviewed in terms yes, of work. Yes, they are means. technically the primary screener. Yeah. Yeah, and this goes to um, the you know to the people that are. It, it, it goes back to personnel requirements, and and residents and fellows do not meet yes. the requirements. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, the.
primary screeners pathologist is the same workload limits as the cytotechnologist. Is this correct? That is correct. But that's correct. And it has to be, and they actually have to technically set those requirements semi-annually as, as well, up to 100 slides uh, per day. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and yes, they can set it for themselves. I mean, we yeah. do realize mm -hmm. that at some programs, they're going to be doing their own negative rescreens and their own workload limits if, if it's a small shop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they yeah. have to do it. And surgical pathology is included in that, again, I'm assuming? Surgical no. path? No. No. Okay. It is not. All right. Which is a bit of a discrepancy, if you will, because that's still a workload, if you will. But um, That's why people get very upset and believe that their boards sh should allow them to sign out as many slides right. and, and to self-monitor. Uh, that's one yeah. of the things that comes up because there isn't the same type of regulation in surgical pathology. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, now, shifting gears a little bit and looking into this five years um, look back. So now that we have some new guidelines and the American Cancer Society has come up with some um, instructions of management and so forth, um, this might be a bit of a philosophical question, but how do you find this five year look back on the current age cell? Um, and is this useful? Is it time to revisit this? Um, how are we doing on this? So the five-year look back is, is again, it's, it's actually regulated. So it's actually part of the regulation. In order to change that, you would actually have to go in and actually change the law and the regulation, um, which, is, which is difficult. Uh, the, and then part of the reason for using five years is that um, if – you go back further than that, the likelihood is, is that this is a lesion that doesn't exist at that point. And so you have, you reach diminishing returns. So even though um, people may not be, in, be screened um, you, yearly, that they're screened over lengthening periods, it still really, uh, in my mind, doesn't change the usefulness of that five-year period. How about shortening the five-year period? Because now if the screening is going to be done every five years, then you don't really have anything to look at. Why are we why are we even doing this? It's Again, it's, it's in the it's in the regulations. And and um, a lot of people are screened more at at a at a lower level, certainly. Um, but mm -hmm. but it is it's part of the regulations to do it in that manner as well. Okay. That's where I think perhaps adding some things, spiking your reviews might mm -hmm. be quite helpful to your laboratory, mm -hmm. like yep. adding your HPV positive negative PAPs to your prospective rescreening and mm -hmm. looking at your post biopsy mm -hmm. reviews. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And anything you, anything you can do to, you know, as, as Jen uh, mentions, kind of spike your, your population there, get more ability to look at cases that might, reveal a problem is is beneficial mm -hmm. yeah so okay but maybe it might be time for kind of to look at this five year look back and revisit this in the clear level at some point who knows um now here's another question i think this was also another question that uh dr brainerd covered so the um the non gynae workload when we're looking at um cytospins thin perhaps your paths what you said with this, this could be counted as a half slide. So should it be counted? Because there are institutions that count it as one slide and then there are institutions that count it as half slide. Where? <laughs> I mean, I think it's, it's kind of up to you. Um, we count it as one slide, even though I, I presented the, the laws, we count it as one slide because it's easier to count it as one slide. And, and we don't, we're not in jeopardy of our workload limits. Uh, we're not close to that 100. Um, so we're okay doing it as one. Mm -hmm. I would say if you're, if you're in a laboratory where your cytotechnologists are flirting with the 100 slides, it might be a time to make a decision to count a cytospin as half a slide. I mean, I think it's kind of up to your um, your individual laboratory circumstance. I, I would say that at least the, in, in the laboratories around us, uh, most people just count it as one because it's kind of, uh, it can be a little bit 
challenging to, to separate them out. You can also count a cell block as a half if you wanted. Um, um, Usually, um, cell blocks don't count though, Jen. And you don't, yeah. they, they don't count. We 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 count them as we count them. Uh, yeah. We make the salience and we count them. But yeah, right. they, you're not required to. They because then if that becomes a histology sample, so it actually a, okay. does not. It's not a clear requirement. Not a clear requirement. No. Okay. That's right. And we do the same too. We count everything as one because we're like you, um, Jen. We we're not close to hitting those workloads. Yeah. Okay. And we count them as a half, um, but uh, we've just set up our our lab information system to be able to do that. Gotcha. But if this was asked on a say a national exam, the answer could be half, or yes. it should be half. Was well, half as a minimum? Yeah. yeah. Half as a minimum. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, right. They should, probably would not count that. Uh, they would probably would. Not, I'm hoping they would not ask a question <laughs> such as that because it really has a couple answers. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. All right. Good to know that. Good to know that. Okay. All right. So another question is: um, If a screening pathologist or a cytotechnologist works ten to twelve hours a day, would they bump up their work limit or? just not be able to screen anything or do they ro do rows after eight hours pass? So you're working for 10 to 12 hours. Well, it's prorated, right? So it's, so the regulation is prorated by a 24 hour period. So, you know, that, that's the key. You can't work, you can't screen over 100. So whether that's a half or a whole, however you're counting it, it can't be over 100 within a 24 hour period. Yeah. So it would be mm -hmm. prorated, and if they hit that prorated total, then yeah, they would have to do something that would be non-screening. Yeah, they have to stop. I see. So they can rows, but they can't review slides any longer. Correct. At that point. And technically, if you work 10 hours and you screened your 100 slides in the first eight hours and you continued to work, you're going to actually fall out of compliance. Mm, okay. Gets tricky. Yeah, it does get tricky. Yes, yes, this this is tricky, definitely. Um, now, another question is: If you track the FNAs uh, of the cytotechnologists and pathologists, do you include the two um, level discrepancy or two difference discrepancy among this? Um, especially, are the cytotechnologists reviewing the cell blocks or are they not? And the particular participant asks: The cytotechs are not really educated to read the cell blocks and what do we do with this is the question i guess in some institutions they do um, review the cell blocks and some they don't but say if the fna is all negative but the cell block has all the material um, there's going to be a two level discrepancy and then what happens and how do you count this i mean i mean for us um the cytotechs are reviewing the cell blocks and so you know that's part of the Not case for them, mm -hmm. but I understand, you know, and for us, it's for better or worse, it's the pathologist. We get the slide second. We're signing out the case. We get to, dis we are the kind of, we're the people who decide if it's a two-step discrepancy. So if I was working with a cytotechnologist and I realized that the cyto that all the materials on a slide they didn't review, I would not mark that as a two-step discrepancy. Mm -hmm. I would use my discretion there. Yeah. We do the same thing. Our cytotechnologists look at cell blocks, um, but we document who, like, it gets complicated because sometimes it, we might split them between two cytotechs and one might see the block and the other one might not, depending on the workload. Um, but to what Jennifer is saying, when we, we review our discrepancies one-on-one -on -one with, our, with our cytopathology director, and so it's up to him to kind of look at it and go, okay, this would be a discrepancy or no, it wouldn't. You should have caught this or maybe this is a learning opportunity. So we leave it up to the director's discretion whether they're going to call that two-step or not. I see, I see. So in general, it seems like it's better if the cytotechnologists are able to review the, um, the uh, cell blocks to kind of put the case together in that case. <laughs> Yeah, it's nice. Actually, it, it, we actually don't do that. Um, it's just, it, it, but it's it is a nice feature. I think if you've got that ability to do it. Mm -hmm. um, now here's another question. Um, say you are in a smaller lab and you have only one cytopathologist. So, what do you do in terms of the lab comparison data, such as the ask cell ratio? Because you don't have one lab. You have the one person, and if you're supposed to compare it, <laughs> are you going to compare yourself to yourself? How does this go? 
you can compare yourself to national data. So, okay. so CAP has that data, as I showed you. So you can actually compare yourself. And they have the data for labs doing thin prep, labs using SurePath. And, and so you can compare yourself to national standards. Okay. And those so are all on the checklist for CAP, too, those um, benchmarks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question is, are QC uh, technical discrepancies? For instance, the pathologist disagreed with the QC tech who disagreed with the primary screener also tracked. Should it be tracked? <laughs> uh, it, it is a very valid question. Um, how much tracking do we do? What do we track? Well, it can, it can work both ways. So you can have a, a, a screen that's then picked up by 10%, then reviewed by the pathologist. The pathologist could agree with the original cytotechnologist who would then not get a discrepancy. Um, or you could have something screened by both people and the pathologist could call it something completely different and both of them might end up with a discrepancy. So it just it, it just depends on, you know, on that process. Right. And I would say we would use, you know, it's the individual cytotech to the pathologist sign out. So each one of those individual cytotechs diagnoses are treated independently against the final diagnosis. Yeah. So to what Mike was saying. And actually, it's it's interesting here because we actually have a, a secondary review of discrepancies um, where we do a, um, uh, we show these to a, uh, a group of, of people who vote um, on them um, anonymously. And so we actually have, have a, a secondary kind of process to decide whether it's a true discrepancy or not. Oh my God, I love it. That's what we do. When we do a two-step, we're required. If if we have a two-step uh, with a cytotechnologist, we have to have a second name, another pathologist on that final report before it goes out. So we have to, we are required to show that and get another opinion. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Very good. Wow. Um, all right. Here's another question about reagent labeling. And uh, this, uh, the number is 30300. Apparently, according to the... Uh, it is. It is? <laughs> okay, good. You know it off the top of your head. How about that? <laughs> Should That's each... scary, but yes. It is. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Uh, should each cartilage in the strainer be labeled with lot number and expiration date? We replace stains weekly. And am I right, reading this correctly? I suppose... I guess this is a staining question, the reagent labeling question, and should it be labeled with the lot number and the expiration date? Um, I believe that that is true, um, it's but I, it, it's on the stain line, and I believe that you still need to do that because you need to know where it came from and what the expiration date is. Yep, and that is actually true. And when you look at the clear recommend or the clear requirements, it's actually a lab standard across all sections. Yeah. Correct. It's just not cytology. Yep. And I would guess that that might be one of the hot button uh, items. It's all yeah. It's it that when you do a, a lab inspection, that's almost always one that you find somewhere in some lab. Yeah. So the lot number needs to be put in there, I guess. And the expiration. And the date. And the expiration date in addition to I have okay. some very creative tools on how to do this, especially for SurePath. So if um, if you just you want, want to send that us? after's email, I may be able to help out there. Yep. Okay. So uh, Ms. Savoya Pinot says, uh, <laughs> write to me and I'll share the creative methods with you. Okay, uh, there's a couple more questions. I'm going to try and ask as many as I can, um, just uh, also being respectful of uh, everybody's time. So uh, another question about is the QC slides. Are the 10% QC slides counting as one and a half or one? I think they should count as one, right? Because they're... They count as one. That's correct. Because it's a manual review. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the second person could count it as one, correct, right? Yes, that is correct. All right. That sounds good. Um, hmm. Let me actually answer that question. 
And I'll look at this one. For pathologists, that will be primary non gynae screeners. If their maximum is 100 slide non gynae limit, can they still continue to screen any number of surgicals in the same eight hours? And I think your answer was yes, sir. Right? Um, yeah. yeah. I, I will say that I don't know of any, and I, I probably should not say this, but um, it's. It, the, the, the pathologists need to keep track of their numbers is really what they need to keep track of. Yeah. Their cyto numbers. Yeah. Their cyto numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question is about the uh, five-year look back for any HCL or tumor cases that need to be rescreened. Does the tumor cases include both squamous and glandular cancers? Yes. Both of them, correct. Mm. Although some, it just says in in CLIA it just says says cancer, but yes, it, it glandular is included in that. Mm -hmm. Now here's here's an interesting question: How do you assess pathologist competency? Um, I showed actually, I, I we assess competency. There's a number of different ways that we do that in our our anatomic pathology laboratory overall. But as I showed you, one of the ways that we do it in cytology is we we look at those um, ASCA to cell ratios and HPV percentages and percentiles, and we compare them overall to the laboratory. We do too. Okay. So actually, you know, that kind of leads to one other and perhaps last question is, uh, do you do report cards for your pathologists? If so, how often do you do it? And uh, what information do you provide in these? And I realize that that is a whole kind of webinar in itself, but <laughs> maybe a quick short answer. We actually don't do a, a separate report card as such for, for our pathologists, but but on our quarterly cytology meetings, we present all of the data, which includes individual pathologist data. Well, in, in essence, you're actually giving the information to them. Correct. Yeah. And what information do you provide them? Uh, all of the things that I showed you, plus um, we also look at our percentages for our, our diagnoses in some uh, other cases uh, like urines and, and biliary. We can use biliary fish data. So we provide a, a number of different data points to our pathologists. When you're talking about scorecards, we, we do something similar where we have, you know, the stat sheet that we give the Cytotex. It's, um, we actually do it monthly now. Um, and we have those available for each individual pathologist as well. So it's not necessarily a scorecard, but it does, like Dr. Henry is saying, give them their snapshot and how they compare to the lab and to the benchmarks, to the CAT benchmarks. Yeah, what we found, and, and this is something that I, I think uh, is pretty true across the board, is that if you give a pathologist their numbers, they're going to want to um, they're going to want to be doing what the rest of the lab is doing. So yes. they, they they tend to self correct. Self -correct. Yes, <laughs> I like exactly. That. I like that. Jen, how about you guys? Um, what so, do you do? We do. Um, we don't, you know, I, I, we don't get a report card. We do get um, the quarterly form that I showed with number of, for GYN cytology. Um, but there are uh, uh, where we get, we do our ASCIS to SIL ratios, our percent HPV positivity in our ASCIS cases. We, we're, we're looking at our ASCIS H rates. So we get that mm -hmm. kind of uh, split apart. Um, so we get that. Um, and then there are our data that we participate in, but we don't get as part of a uh, scorecard, which, you know, you know, our competencies on uh, frozens, on um, um, discrepancies with our finals, uh, rows mm -hmm. versus final, stuff like that. Um, but it's not, it's not given out as a report. I don't think, I'm not sure how well, people would like to get a report card. I'm not sure about that. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. Good to know. Good to know. Well, this is very nice and it has been fabulous uh, to listen to all three of you. I'd like to thank you all uh, for coming in and uh, giving your views and what you're doing in your own laboratories. Uh, for our listeners who are asking about the handout, we do have the PowerPoint and I believe uh, 
uh, Sandra will be able to send it out um, in the follow-up email to all the registrants. As a, as a PDF, Sandra. As a PDF, as a PDF, correct. Um, and uh, once again, thank you all for coming. And um, hopefully see you in next week's webinar where we will be talking about some salivary cytology with uh, Dr. Zahra Maliki. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.